Hey everyone, I'm Mr. Ray, and today we're going to talk about the Law of Signs. Before I get into the Law of Signs, I want to give you a very brief motivation for why we need it in the first place. This is the fifth video in an ongoing series about trigonometry, so if you need to brush up on basic sines, cosines, tangents, or anything like that, take a look at the first four videos. I'll put the links in the description. If you're watching along with the series, then this picture should look familiar to you. The last video was dealing with pictures like this, where we had to use multiple triangles in order to solve for x. However, if you look carefully, you'll notice that there's something different about this picture. I don't have any side lengths for a right triangle. What I mean by that is 17 is the only length I know in this picture. It's a side of this triangle, which is clearly not a right triangle. Now there are two right triangles here, this little one and this larger one, but I don't know any lengths of the sides of one of those triangles. So if I were to draw the small triangle, I wouldn't be able to write sine, cosine, or tangent because there are two more unknowns. If I use the big triangle, I'm in the same position. We're going to come back to this problem at the end of this video, but I'm showing it to you now to establish that we have a problem here. This is something we cannot solve using just sine, cosine, and tangent. And the reason is we're restricted to working in right triangles with sine, cosine, and tangent. That's where the law of sines comes in. So here's what the law of sines looks like. Law of sines says that if you have any triangle, A, B, C, then these two statements are true. To make sense out of these two statements, let me first explain how triangles are labeled in geometry. You probably already know that we call vertices by capital letters, so this is vertex A, B, and C in this triangle, and then we name the sides of the triangle using the corresponding lowercase letters. So across from angle A is side lowercase a. Across from angle B is side lowercase b, and across from angle C is side lowercase c. What is amazing about the law of sines is that this works in any triangle. It does not need to be a right triangle. Any triangle at all, these two relationships are true. So what is law of sines saying? That the ratio of this length divided by the sine of that angle is the same as if we take the length of b and divide it by the sine of b, that has to be exactly the same ratio as it was when we took side a and divided it by the sine of angle a. This is also the same ratio as if we take side c and divide it by the sine of the angle across from it. In other words, in a triangle, the ratio of a side to the sine of the angle across from that side is always the same as any other side and the sine of the angle across from that side. Since these are fractions, we can also take the reciprocals, and you can see law of sines written this way. These are just two different ways of saying the same thing. It's important to remember that the capital letters are vertices, so the angles, and the lowercase letters are side lengths, across from the corresponding angles. So how do we know that this relationship holds up? Let's begin by labeling a couple of the sides in this triangle. Across from angle A, we're going to find side lowercase a, and across from angle B, we're going to find side lowercase b. Now across from C is side lowercase c, but I'm not going to label that one yet. You'll see why in a moment. The way we're going to move forward with this argument is we're going to construct an altitude in this triangle. Remember that what makes something an altitude is that it has to form a right angle to the side of the triangle it's drawn to, and let's go ahead and call that altitude h for height. Notice that as soon as I construct that altitude, I have created two smaller right triangles out of the original larger triangle. There's the one on the left, and there's the one on the right. We're going to deal with those individually now. Let's take a look at angle A in the left-hand triangle. It's true that the sine of angle A is equal to h over b. Let's look at the triangle on the right-hand side now. In this triangle, the sine of angle B is equal to h over A. What I'd like to do now is take both of these, and I'm going to solve each one for h. So over here we have b times the sine of A equals h, and over here we have h is equal to A times the sine of B. Well, if these are both equal to h, then they must equal each other. So it's true that b times the sine of a has to equal a times the sine of b. The last thing I'm going to do here is divide both sides by a, b. That might seem like a strange step at first, but remember what we're trying to get to here, this law of sines that I showed you in the beginning. So on the left-hand side, we have b divided by b. That's just 1, so it goes away, and we're left with the sine of a divided by a. On the right-hand side, we have a divided by a. So that is 1, that goes away, and we're left with the sine of b over b. That is 2 thirds of our law of sines right there. Now, where does the other third come from? Well, this altitude was a random choice. We didn't have to use that altitude. I could have also dropped an altitude from b or an altitude from a. And if you do that with either one of the other angles, you'll get the rest of this expression here, which we call the law of sines. Now that we know what law of sines is and why we want it, let's take a look at an example of how we'd use this. So here's a triangle where we have two angles. 
one side and we're missing the other side. We'd like to find it. So what we're going to do is first start by noticing that angle 40 is across from angle X. So that's a pair, an angle and the side across from it. Angle 110 here is across from the 25. So that's another pair, an angle and the side across from it. That's important because law of sines works on pairs of angles and their opposite sides. You need to be able to establish a pair of angles and a side and another pair of angles and the side across from it. Once you do that, then the rest of it is easy. We're just going to plug into the equation. I always like to start with the thing I'm looking for. In this case, that's x. So law of sines tells me that x divided by the sine of the angle across from it, that would be the sine of 40 in this case, is equal to 25 divided by the sine of the angle across from it. So that would be the sine of 110. When I cross multiply, I have x times the sine of 110 equal to 25 times the sine of 40. And if I divide both sides by the sine of 110, I get x is equal to this large thing here. Notice that I solve for x before I pick up my calculator. I don't want to try to type these into the calculator here. Then I'm going to get a lot of decimals that I have to keep track of, and I don't want to round to the end of the problem. Once I get to this point, I'm going to type this into the calculator exactly as you see it here. So I'm going to round that to about 17.1. And that's all law of sines is. It's just another relationship in a triangle that allows us to solve for a missing side as long as we have enough to fill in the rest of the proportion. We've got to have three pieces of information, so we only have one unknown here. All right, this next problem has a little trick to it that's easy to fall for, but it's easy to catch if you're careful. When you look at this here, we have three pieces of information and one unknown, so it seems like we're good to go for the law of sines. But let's be careful. Let's find the angle and the side across from it, right? So 15 pairs up nicely with x there. Now, what about this 20? 20 is actually across from this angle. So can you imagine what the common mistake is? The common mistake is to set up 20 in a ratio with 100 or the sine of 100, but they don't belong together. 100 has to do with this side over here, nothing to do with 20. We need this angle. Is that a problem? Well, it shouldn't be. I mean, it's a triangle, so if we know two of the angles, we can find the third. We have 115 degrees here, which means this one's going to need to be 65. Once we figure out the angle that actually corresponds with the 20, then we can just go ahead and set up law of sines exactly like we did in the last problem. Again, I always like to start my proportion with something that I'm looking for, my unknown. So I would say x over the sine of 15 is equal to 20 over the sine of 65. Something I didn't mention specifically before is it's very important that once you decide which way to write this proportion, that you stay with that pattern. So what I mean by that is I started with one of the side lengths, and I put the angle in the denominator, the sine of the angle. That means over here it's really important that I also have a side length in the numerator and the sine of the angle in the denominator. It doesn't matter which one you start with. I could have put sine of 15 in the numerator, but then I would need the sine of 65 in the numerator on this side. Hopefully that makes sense. So once you have your proportion, we're going to cross multiply and solve. And I get x times the sine of 65 equals 20 times the sine of 15. That gives me x equal to 20 sine of 15 divided by the sine of 65. Again, I will always solve this for x before I plug it in my calculator. That way I'm not rounding until the end. And I get about 5.7115, so I'm just going to call that about 5.7 for this one. Now, law of sines works for finding missing angles, too. It's not just for missing sides. In this triangle, we don't know what theta is, but we do know the side across from it is 25. We also know that the angle 15 is across from the side of length 20. So we can set up law of sines to find this missing angle. I'm going to always again start with the thing I'm looking for. So I'm going to say the sine of theta over the angle across from it, 25, is equal to the sine of 15 over the side across from it, 20. Notice that since I put the sine of the angle in the numerator on the left, I also have the sine of an angle in the numerator on the right. Cross multiplying, I get 20 times the sine of theta equals 25 times the sine of 15, which means the sine of theta is 25 times the sine of 15 over 20. So remember, this is the sine of theta. I need to get to theta. So the way I need to do that is I need to undo this sine function. I need to use the inverse sine. Theta is going to be the inverse sine of 25 sine 15 over 20, this whole thing here. If you need to brush up on inverse sine, cosine, or tangent, check out the second video in this series, link in the description. But when you plug this one into your calculator, you should get about 18.876. So we're going to call that 18.88. So I've shown you several examples of how law of sines works in a basic application. Let's go back to that first problem from the beginning. Remember how this problem presented an issue for us because we only knew this 17. We didn't know any parts of the right triangle on the left or the big right triangle. But now that we know the law of sines, we can take advantage of this blue triangle here, which we do know a side in. So let's think about what's going on in this triangle. We have this angle 15, and across from it would be this side over here. 
I'm going to call that Y. So that's one unknown already. I can't have a second unknown. Well, let's see what else we have here. We've got 17, which is across from this angle over here in the triangle. So we need to figure out what that angle is. Luckily, we've got plenty of information to do that. You can do it one of two ways. You could take the supplement of 23, so that would be 157. If you add that to 15, you get 172, which means you've got another 8 degrees to go up over here in the triangle. Or if you remember that 23 is an exterior angle to this blue triangle, then you know that the exterior angle is the sum of the two non-adjacent interior angles. So 15 plus what gets you 23? Well, that's going to have to be 8. Either way, you can figure out that that angle is 8. And once you do, we can use law of sines to figure out what y is. So we know that y over the sine of 15 is equal to 17 over the sine of 8. We can cross multiply to get y times the sine of 8 equals 17 times the sine of 15 which means y is 17 times the sine of 15 divided by the sine of 8. I'm not even going to type that into my calculator right, right now because I'm going to use y in this triangle over here. Remember, what I really want is x. So how do I get to x? Well, x is in this little right triangle. The sine of 23 is equal to x over y. I'll put that over 1 and cross multiply to give me x equals y times the sine of 23. And then I'm going to type this into my calculator. Now remember what y is, that's this whole expression over here. So if you type this into your calculator, you'll get that that's approximately 31.614 and some change. When you plug it in your calculator, you'll get about 12.35286. So let's go ahead and call that 12.353. So here's a problem that we couldn't have solved with just sine, cosine, and tangent. But the law of sines works in any triangle, which means that if you don't have access to a right triangle, you can use the law of sines anytime you need to find either a missing side or a missing angle. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe to my channel, feel free to leave a comment below, and as always, have a great day.